So before I consider uh, extending any respect whatsoever to the regulators, uh, I should like to see the rules being harmonized and consistent between markets because human biology is the same everywhere. The risks are the same everywhere. The risk appetite might not be the same everywhere, but that doesn't seem to be what this is really about. This is just uh, local lobbying, uh, caprice of some uh, Karen in whatever regulatory agency having a beef uh, with uh, or a hang up with a specific thing. And it's just so random. So, okay, first make the rules consistent because otherwise they are not evidence-based. Uh, and then we can talk. Of course, the rules being globally harmonized is a necessary but not a sufficient uh, proof of uh, the rules being evidence-based, obviously. Uh, all evidence-based rule sets are going to be consistent, but not all consistent rule sets need to be uh, evidence-based. It's possible to have a globally harmonized regime of institutionalized bullshit. This is indeed the case. I hope this is obvious. The very existence of regulators is a loophole in uh, democratic systems. It is uh, a way to legislate by fiat without any oversight or accountability or democratic mandate. Of course, the fucking lover of science counterpoint would be okay, but those are like expert uh, discussions uh, and uh, facts are not open to uh, uh, opinion and uh, democratic uh, forces. Uh, well, but this isn't about the facts themselves. This is fundamentally about uh, risk tolerance and risk appetite in society. And that is a fundamentally uh, political question and should be open to democratic forces. We are also witnessing the law of unintended consequences in the interaction between two uh, principles that our society has, has chosen. So you can choose a moral principle and it's all good. You can choose a different moral principle and it's all good. But then when you cho choose both of these principles, they interact in un unexpected ways that screw up your, your shit. And in this case, uh, it's an uh, interplay between uh, placing safety as the highest good and also having a deep commitment to egalitarianism. So you cannot have different rules for different people. Uh, the result is that everyone is uh, subjected to uh, nannying, uh, overbearing, uh, babysitting, over-regulation and stifling in all aspects of, of life uh, because the rules are designed for the lowest common denominator to keep them safe. And then everyone else is subjected to the same rules as well. So I would happily uh, just take an exam in biochemistry that would uh, enable me to buy more stuff over the counter. That would be a fair compromise. But of course, that's never going to happen. So the reason why you cannot consent to a non-medical blood transfusion is the reason you cannot drive 20 kilometers per hour faster on the freeway is the reason there are giant warning labels on everything instructing you not to ingest roofing nails for breakfast uh, is the reason you cannot buy pyrocetam over the counter or tonkat alley in europe is the reason you have to sit through uh, insulting health and safety uh, classes at work and of course, once uh, safetyism and egalitarianism uh, combine, uh, as they logically necessarily have to, to produce a uh, lowest common denominator tyranny of a billion petty rules uh, that everyone who isn't IQ 70 has to chafe against, uh, this plays very well into the hands of a type of people who uh, thoroughly enjoy being on the administering side of that and treating everyone else like inept, incompetent, infants in need of uh, adult oversight and uh, benevolent, enlightened guidance. This is why I need orbital and diameter weaponry. Everyone else equal and safe under my auspices is, of course, the essence of what frog people on Twitter have recently started calling the longhouse. And Jordan Peterson would probably call the devouring mother. It's not wrong. So, evaluate my stack. What I do to look like this at 38 is live on pizza and gin tonics. Which is to say, like with all things health related, 
uh, unless we're talking about like nanotechnology or genetic engineering, once you remove the big killers like smoking and uh, completely sedentary lifestyles, anything that you do uh, with uh, supplements and vitamins and diet and uh, lifestyle interventions is fiddling around the fringes of genetics. Final note about the FDA and regulations uh, before I stop <laughs> spamming up the channel and go uh, go to work. Uh, I wonder if uh, we could leverage the moral principle, my body, my choice, which seems to have a pretty strong standing in culture to uh, advocate for uh, more uh, patient choice in experimental medical treatments. I think it's fascinating. Thank you. I will uh, have a look at this link that you've just sent me and I appreciate you sharing that. I actually agree with you on that point as well. I, it's probably lazy language of me to use the word impossible. Um, and I suppose it makes me think about ways of communicating that have already been attempted and uh, music and art are attempts to communicate those things that cannot be put into words. Um, and originally classical music and, and art was commissioned to communicate religious, um, if not spiritual, um, ideas and concepts. So I guess that those were the, the early, early attempts to, um, articulate the unarticulable, if that's even a word. People tried my body, my choice when it came to the COVID vaccine, but of course the hypocrites drove right over it. Hmm, did these hypocrites perhaps refer to externalities and consequences on other people when trampling on private choice regarding one's own body? Now, where have I recently heard this? Hmm. Collectivists like to cite the collective good, but this is never about rationality or consistency. It's always about power. That's why trying to catch people in contradictions never tends to work. What wasn't arrived at by reason cannot be refuted by reason. Collectivism is one of the biggest misnomers in circulation. It's always and everywhere a euphemism for the self-interest of the rulers. We should all work together as a team to advance my interests. What wasn't arrived at by reason cannot be refuted by reason. Interesting. Uh, I'm curious how did the Enlightenment win uh, against the religious consensus in Europe, uh, which definitely wasn't arrived at by reason. Uh, either there are exceptions or uh, it was the case that uh, a new communication technology allowed the breakdown of uh, mass falsified preferences. So not many people were actually like hardcore on, on board with the medieval memeplex. And once it started uh, cracking, uh, people just piled on to uh, break it down. Uh, so what does that say about our current situation? What we need is, is a preference cascade because most people, uh, even nominally on the Vogue side of history, are faking for uh, self-interested or uh, cowardly reasons. If it's falsified preferences at scale, then then we can, you know, repeat what we did 400 years ago. Maybe this is a general principle that we can work with. Uh, most people are not actually insane, and every time there is one of these uh, idiotic ideologies, uh, it's a matter of falsified preferences at scale, which means that once uh, it starts cracking, uh, everyone joins in kicking the wounded tyrant, um, hopefully. And this is also why they all rely on censorship and intimidation, because they are terrified of preference cascades and their grip on power, even when it appears overwhelming, is actually tenuous and insecure at all times. And in fact, a reliance on censorship and intimidation is how you recognize these um, idiotic uh, ideologies and, quote, demonic, uh, unquote, meme plexes. This is actually reassuring. Small complication, the preferences are usually falsified unconsciously. So this, this happens on the level of uh, 
elephants in the brain where people pretend even to themselves that they are actually true believers uh, for pragmatic reasons. And then when it uh, flips, they uh, reinvent their personal uh, narratives as always having been secretly opposed to it. And hooray, we can finally uh, tell the truth. I've observed this in uh, people uh, who lived through the Velvet uh, Revolution in Czechoslovakia, uh, when suddenly every uh, party cadre and uh, leftist intellectual became a Reaganite, Thatcherite, uh, free market, uh, neoliberal capitalist, like literally overnight. It was, well, I was, I never actually agreed with Marxism. It was always bullshit, but you know, I'm glad that now I can tell the truth. And if there was another revolution, these same people would uh, effortlessly flip into whatever else uh, came on top. So it is uh, preference falsifi uh, falsification with the complicating caveat that it's unconscious preference falsification. Most people are fundamentally pragmatic um, conformists. Still, still uh, preference cascades will work. Uh, Elon buying Twitter is probably the most important thing that happened in about 15 years. This is getting slightly off topic, so just a final note. Uh, this um, ideological conformism uh, as a dominant force is uh, especially uh, delicious in post-communist uh, societies because our young people uh, have the same uh, socialist tendencies as uh, young people everywhere, but at the same time, the polite uh, society uh, position is that communism uh, was evil and socialism is uh, marginally better, but it's still, you know, an embarrassing position to hold. So young people uh, like the educated liberal uh, type hold deeply socialist opinions while being uh, nominal uh, anti-communists. And uh, you see these people in, in uh, Prague cafes with uh, Václav Havel t-shirts and you just know that these same people, are, in, if, if they lived in the 50s, they would be hardcore uh, Stalinists. And indeed, they are trying to import cancel culture and shit while being, oh, co uh, fuck communism. Uh, but as, as uh, you said, you cannot catch these people in contradictions. And to elegantly tie this back up into the actual topic of the room, I wonder if... Uh, Preference cascade can be put in uh, attitudes to risk in uh, medical research. So the two basic motivating forces in all organisms are moving away from danger and moving towards uh, desired things. Uh, currently, we are moving away from danger at the expense of colossal opportunity costs. But once there is a sufficiently tempting morsel on the table, once uh, anyone actually has a breakthrough and can deliver a uh, radical life extension or in a similar fashion, uh, hard artificial intelligence and robots, uh, the logic will change for, for many people and there will be a preference cascade away from, from doomerism and uh, precautionary uh, stagnation and towards uh, EA technology. Uh, so one of the things that uh, eccentric billionaires experimenting on themselves can pull off is do one of these breakthroughs that will uh, yeah change the calculation for for people and uh, flip the preference uh, situation at scale and from a persuasion point of view concrete beats abstract so if there are abstract worries about the far-fetched risks and socio-economic impacts uh versus an actual immortality pill that you can buy for $10, uh, people are not going to have trouble choosing correctly. What we need is to uh, ignore the barking uh, and do it. All we need is a proof of concept. Just takes one team pulling it off. And public opinion will be an avalanche. Great points by both Aaron and you, Logan. So... I mean, thinking about that, um, it's not just the FDA. We have to also look at the global side of the things where EMA, for example, is doing something what you are, you guys are talking about. So the FDA is uh, mostly yes, private, you know, government owned and regulating through the government, but EMA as well as uh, 
your environmental protection agency have uh, done an outreach to um, for creating focus working groups. And these working groups have a lot of people coming from private industry, contributing with the expert knowledge and creating a big dossier or, you know, important information that's needed with regards to the speed or with regards to the safety of a particular drug or a chemical that's getting released, especially on the side of this non-animal approaches, because that's something which has come new in the mandate of FDA recently. However, for Environmental Protection Agency, it was um, in the mandate for a really long time. And they are kind of setting up these focused work groups, which are tending to create a certain sense of guideline as to what and how would something be passed to be safe and where you would uh, kind of take the speed route, especially for the chemicals. Mm, um, with regards to the product safety for EMA, it's, it's much more difficult to do that because when you come towards the speed of a product, you might end up having issues or even for FDA, you might have end up having issues on pharmacovigilance, which is such an important topic to care about. So as long as I think it's a, it's a very good point that we need to find a hybrid solution with regards to having different stakeholders in this process, because on the one side, as much as a patient would like to you know, my body, my rule kind of thing that would like to do things according to themselves. There's a certain sense of knowledge and epigenetics uh, theory, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that uh, maybe more experts are more used to and more accustomed to than than a layman at hand. So therefore, no place um, can be given a full record or a full trophy to just dis- to create a decision. And we we need to come up with a strategy where we have contributions coming from different stakeholders to be able to create a more holistic format of uh, letting a particular product out. So uh, what with that, I mean, I just wanted to share an example of something that happened very recently in the European Union. Not saying that this is the right way to go forward because it's also the slowest way to go forward. But uh, for example, if you click on this link, you'll figure out that Around 1.2 million European citizens signed up for uh, signed up with the European Commission seeking to protect and strengthen the EU cosmetics animal testing ban uh, to initiate legislative changes to achieve consumer, worker, and environmental protection for all cosmetic ingredients without testing on animals for any purpose at any time. And the second debate that they were having was that the transformation of EU chemical regulations to be able to ensure human health and the environment are both protected by managing chemicals without the addition of new animal testing requirements. And third is to modernize safety science in the EU itself uh, so that they can commit to a legislative proposal, plot a roadmap to phase out animal testing uh, stepwise in the EU before the end of the current legislative term, which is obviously these are very abstract and very high level discussions and they are quite slow discussions to have but it's just a an a prototypical example of of something that might end up having certain sense of collect, collective debate constituting to a particular legislative reform that is then pursued by maybe the regulators alongside some private experts to bring out a product just uh, sharing some extra side information that's a fair question. I would say that reason beats religion by being correct, not by out arguing it. So, for example, if you have the right philosophy, then you are more likely to develop the right technology. You are more likely to be successful in business. You're more likely to be successful in science. Uh, you're more likely to be fit and healthy. So, through reason, you can arrive at better diets, you can arrive at better technology, better weaponry, and more money. And eventually, that's what wins out. That's what wins the argument, not reason against unreason, not reason against religion. Kind of, though I agree with the Nassim Taleb view that it's the intolerant minority that wins because the center just wants to get along. So the center tends to follow the intolerant minority over time. And so who's going to create a better intolerant minority than collectivists where it's in their very nature to gang up? And the leftover hard scrabble people who are just sort of uh, in a different category are not naturally as united as collectivists by definition because they're individuals. So what you normally tend to have happen is you get a bunch of collectivists who are an intolerant minority, the center goes along, and then you have a bunch of people who are just kind of left together as a gang of individuals that then has to try and, and band up together, but they don't actually have that much in common other than that they don't like the collectivists. 
I agree. I think Elon buying Twitter was the best positive force uh, that's happened in a long, long time for things like free speech and free thought. Completely agree. I think the mandatory COVID vaccines flipped a lot of young people into being against the medical establishment. And I think the same way any breakthrough in anti-aging or life extension or health extension will also make people pro-technology.